to the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education at the University of Southern Maine. It's wonderful to have so many people with us from near and far. My name is Libby Bischoff and I'm the Executive Director of the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education here at USM, as well as a professor of history. It's my pleasure tonight to welcome you to the Map Library's annual Maps in New York Times lecture, which this year will be delivered by our friend Tim Wallace and entitled Mapping the 2020 Election with a lot of historical context. This evening, Tim will speak on the topic for about 50 to 60 minutes, and then my colleague, Dr. Matthew Edney, Osher Chair in the History of Cartography and our faculty scholar, will moderate the Q&A. As this is a Zoom webinar, in order to participate in the Q&A, please just hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your questions. For those of you who haven't spent much time on Zoom webinars, participants can be neither seen nor heard, so you don't need to worry about that. And we will be recording this presentation for those who can't make it um, at this time. So we will get to as many questions at the end as we can up until we reach our time limit. Tonight's lecture is made possible by an endowed lecture fund established in 1994 by the New York Times Company Foundation and an anonymous donor in honor of Walter E. Matson, who was the former president and chief operating officer of the New York Times. Mr. Matson, who graduated um, from Deering High School in 1949, um, after serving in the Marine Corps, sought his degree at Portland Junior College, then Portland University, two of USM's predecessor institutions. Like so many of our 21st century students at USM, Mr. Matson, a veteran, worked his way through his undergraduate education. He was a printer at the Portland Press Herald at night and a student by day. He continued his career in the newspaper business after graduation in advertising, printing, and production up and down the East Coast with his family and sought an additional degree in electrical engineering along the way. In 1960, he began a more than three decade career at the New York Times, rising from assistant production manager to president of the company. He retired in 1993 and passed away in 2016. Mr. Matson's legacy is a testament to what a tremendous work ethic and a solid USM education can accomplish. And we're grateful to this fund for making it possible to invite nationally renowned speakers to share with our communities locally, nationally, and even globally tonight, thanks to Zoom. Before I introduce our dear friend, Tim, I would just like to offer a land acknowledgement for Machigan the truest name in Maliseet poet Muku Paul's words of the now called city of Portland, Maine, where the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education sits on the campus of the University of Southern Maine. We sit on land, I sit on land this evening that was once water and once part of a water-based ecosystem, which for thousands of years before the French and English set foot on the neck, provided for the indigenous peoples of the Donland, the Wabanaki, and those who were here from the beginning in kinship with the land and with the water. And we acknowledge this truth as we acknowledge the contemporary presence of the Abenaki, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet peoples, the Wabanaki Confederacy, and as we acknowledge the devastation of settler colonialism past and present. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce Tim. Dr. Tim Wallace is currently senior editor for geography at the New York Times. Previously, he was a graphic edit graphics editor for the Times from 2012 to 2018, where he also created some maps of that previous contentious election in 2016. And he was a creative lead at the Descartes Labs in New Mexico from 2018 to 2020. Tim holds a BA in Classics, Geography and Art History from McAllister College, a Master's in Maritime Archaeology from the University of Southampton, and a PhD in Geography from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So for those of you students out there joining us tonight who are wondering what to do with their various uh, liberal arts and sciences degrees, Tim is a great example of all the places you can go. It's a true delight to welcome our dear friend and colleague back to the MAP Library. And although he's broadcasting from New Mexico this evening, 
we hope to welcome him and his family back to Maine in person to come and visit us at the MAP Library in the not too distant future. Coming out of such a contentious election season made even more difficult in the midst of a global pandemic. And as our country continues to reckon with our troubled legacy of racism, I for one am eager to join Tim for a behind the scenes look into what it has been like to map the 2020 election and to work in a newsroom, albeit virtually. And I wanna thank Tim for taking the time to be here with us this evening. Thanks Tim and turning it over to you. Okay, is this, uh, can everyone see this? You are good. Okay, great. I'll get started then. Uh, thank you, Libby, for that warm welcome and, and thank you uh, for having me. Uh, this, this presentation is uh, mapping the 2020 election, um, but because of how historic it was uh, in nature, I'm going to be giving quite an exhaustive uh, background, a little bit of uh, historic context on how uh, elections have been mapped and how politics have been mapped by the times over uh, the past several decades and even century. Um, and then also giving a more recent context, uh, framing it in, in the context of uh, 2016 and what a historic uh, election that was, um, both in the result and also how the media responded to it and how, how uh, the times covered it. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Libby and, and everyone at the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education. I really appreciate uh, you having me. Um, and uh, I especially appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak uh, when not many people get to speak in person. Uh, I, I, I like the opportunity to, to talk about my work. I appreciate it. Thank you. So let's get started. Uh, Election years typically in the newsroom or any newsroom are a kind of a time of like whimsy and excitement. Um, this is a little clip from SNL. It's Fred Armisen kind of mocking how the you know, news media gets excited about maps, uh, election maps especially. Uh, but this year was, was not quite the same. This year we were dealing with a global pandemic that spread rapidly across the globe and across the US. This is an animation of cases over time as they spread. Um, and as, as these cases spread, the economy turned down, people uh, were, started working from home, isolation set in, um, and, and we, know, we know the whole story. Uh, this is a very different sort of backdrop for um, election mapping and, and election coverage than a, a typical election in the past. So if we go back to the beginning, with the, with the way that the New York Times has covered elections. Uh, we don't see maps right away. This is the first uh, New York Times front page uh, after an election is in 1852. There's no map, but there is a little table. Uh, this trend sort of continued for uh, decades, actually. In 1856, these are uh, the front pages the day after and two days after the election, and we see uh, made more exhaustive tables of results. And these were all sort of preliminary results as they were coming in. Um, in 1889, we see a, a graphic table. So we've just skipped over a few decades, which is a, a bit surprising to me because during the Civil War and the, the second half of the 1800s is when we start to see a lot more maps in news and especially in the New York Times, big full page, front page maps. And they're, um, as far as we know, uh, were not any uh, election maps in the New York Times during that time period. But we do have this chart in 1889 covering the results of the 1888 election. And it's doing so in a very like sort of stylized graphic way. Here's the president by state and county. And it's this big full, you know, four page spread of how the votes came in. The first uh, map to appear in, uh, or what we believe to be the first map to appear in the New York Times related to an election was in 1896. Um, this is a big sort of chunky looking map at the bottom of A1, the front page. 
um, which is kind of uh, pretty, pretty rough uh, geometry. You know, this is at a time where uh, precision cartography was, was uh, definitely available, but this uh, precision was not the name of the game um, in the composing room. Um, it was more about getting the story and getting it out quickly. So these shapes are rough, but they get you the information that you need to know who won each uh, location, each state or territory. Uh, moving forward a bit in 1904, uh, we see a similar styled map. This goes on and on for, for several decades. Surprisingly in 1904 as well, we have the first uh, print color map. This is something that a librarian at the New York Public Library dug up for me in 2016. Uh, Kate Kords found this. Uh, it was a special section, so it wasn't in the paper. The paper was not um, was not a color paper. It wasn't. There wasn't printed in color in 1904. But they did have special editions, sort of like extra sections. And this was a, an extra special uh, where you know uh, they were able to use color because it was a limited run. And you see that they, you have these ziggurats that show the, the different uh, results for each state. And um, there's also sort of like wobbly uh, line, line style for the states. Going back to the regular print paper, uh, we start to see kind of uh, different pattern fills for state results. Um, and we, we're starting to see some sort of like differently shaped states to, to maybe help readers uh, uh, understand the states that they're most familiar with or, or, or some such. We see these maps with this lopsided Nor uh, New England, um, which still sort of baffles me, but we're also seeing this pattern fill with doubtful. This map, I, I, I can't help but think you know, when I look at it that it's so heavy in the Northeast that it might just tip over. Um, and this is uh, this is something you see from the late 1800s through like the you know mid 1900s. You'll see some of these maps in print that are a little bit uh, stylized. They start with a projection like an Albers projection, an equal area projection of the U.S. But then somehow uh, you know an artist gets a, hand, a hold of it and they they alter it a bit. That map in particular reminds me of the 2005 Ben Carson campaign map which um, sort of inexplicably uh, took parts of New England and uh, jammed them up uh, in Canada. I'm not sure exactly what, uh, where, what the origins of that were or who made that gaffe, but it does have the same look as that, um, that early 1900s uh, New York Times map. As we get closer to the middle of the 1900s, we see more pattern fills. So we're getting a little bit more elaborate with what we can tell in the map. We have Republican, Democrat, progressive, doubtful. We have all these different, uh, you know, hatching and, and uh, dot patterns. Um, you know, it, this is uh, something that continued for years. And you can see when you go back and forth in some of these maps, these maps are four years apart. The shapes of these states are very similar. It's, it's clear that just as you would today see a map that looks similar to another one that you've seen published recently, they were probably working off of some source material or templates that, that had been knocking around for a while. I particularly like this uh, label of Massachusetts, probably because I was born there. So I, I just think it's sort of fun to look at uh, abbreviations like uh, doubt for doubtful when they're not quite sure what the results are. And this is something that this year in 2020, we, we tried to be careful about not publishing results uh, when they were in doubt, we, we were waiting. And I'll get, get to some of that later. This is, uh, I think, probably the most complicated pattern fill map that I've seen in the New York Times archive from uh, 1932. Um, what it's doing is showing several different things at once. Um, and it, there, this goes on, there, there are several more like this. Um, which I'll get to in a second. This is a sort of whimsical map from 1932 as well that shows uh, lame duck representatives and senators. Uh, the senators get a jaunty cap. You can see that lame duck senator, they get the top hat. Here's more pattern fill. This time it's sort of like a, a you know, like one of those thermometers that you would see at a fundraiser where they're trying to figure out, you know, trying to show you how much of something is, uh, you've gotten to your, toward your goal. And this is the, proportion of vote for uh, Roosevelt and Landon. And um, 
I find this slightly hard to read, but I do enjoy it as sort of inspiration when you're digging through the archives of what has been done in the past and, and whether it was effective or not. Here's a map that's just kind of like a chart on a map. Um, we see this nowadays with uh, maps of the US. There's some later in this presentation that show each state is a square. Uh, so, but they're organized and arranged in, in sort of like the shape of the United States so that you can find your state quickly based on what region your state is in. Here we have a key within each state that gives the results for the past several elections. Um, it's quite a lot. It's, uh, it's like a lookup table or an index for, for all of those results, but in a map form. Here we start getting a little fancy with a, a gratuitous perspective uh, block diagram with uh, many more pattern fills as well. We have uh, polka dots and like little circles and things that look like my grandpa's tie from the 1980s. Um, here's a little close up of the Midwest on some of those. Here's another one. This reminds me of the one that tipped over. This is where the shape just kind of gets a bit freehand in part of the country. This is a uh, couple images from the Library of Congress. I thought it would be worth throwing in here showing uh, what the art department looked like in the 1940s. So there's a cartographer there. Of course, he has his uh, cigar uh, with in, in both instances, both when he's doing his research and when he's doing his cartography. Um, th this is what the, the work environment looked like when maps like this were being made. And here's a cartogram of, uh, I like this title, the 1940 election interpreted geographically. I, I think that could be, without seeing the visual, could mean almost anything. Um, but what we're, what we're seeing here is a cartogram. So the states have been stretched to uh, represent the uh, popular vote cast in each in each state. So they're not a drawn, they're not actually drawn geographically, they're drawn according to the number of votes that were cast. And these were a bit popular in the 40s. Here's another one, it's sort of a, a more geometric, and here they call it a mathematical map because they couldn't quite decide what to call it in the 40s. Um, but they were experimenting with different forms. We are back in the, in the, in the 50s with a more pattern fill um, and here again, more pattern fill. In the 60s, now this is when I guess Matson, the namesake for this uh, lecture, would have started. This is the type of uh, map that was being created at the times. So, uh, this is sort of geometric looking cartogram. And then again, there's another cartogram here from the 60s. And I have a pretty giant leap here to 1980. Uh, but I do, I enjoy this. This is something, someone who until very recently was still working at the Times, David Dunlap, uh, gave this account of this map that he made in 1980. The soft edges and wide borders between states reveal my invention of an electoral map that could be altered right on the stone on the composing room floor. So this is something that he could update really quickly right before it went to press. Like color forms, there were sets of pre-cut states with different tones for each candidate. And then this is the sort of the, the bummer of it, but which is uh, more often uh, true than it is not in uh, journalism in preparing for an election. The effort was unwarranted by events because of course, uh, Reagan easily beat Carter in a, a bit of a landslide. So he didn't need all of those different color forms to uh, ready. He, he could just throw down a bunch of uh, Reagan's tone and uh, call it done. This is something, uh, it's a, a photo either from the 70s or 80s of the maps department at the New York Times. And I did ask around this week if anyone knew when exactly it was from. And I'm sorry to say that no one does. They guessed based on the attire that it was from the 70s, but I would be uh, remiss to, to make a very specific uh, claim as to when this the photo is from. But it's interesting because you can see it's, uh, they're still using these tools uh, that we would, you know, would have seen in, in the earlier composing room uh, photo. We have the T-square and uh, we have other things here like, like this uh, annotation that the department only had one telephone. And um, I like this industrial sized trash container, which I guess uh, nowadays would be uh, people's uh, computer desktops with all of the stuff that they're just letting sit there until they finally clear it away.
Now in the 80s, the time started to uh, transition to digital. Um, the, the hot type uh, press stopped in uh, 1978. And so the computer or, or the, the paper was being set using computers. And in the 80s, graphics started to be uh, created in uh, using computers as well. This is an example I like to show from 1989 of this expansion of um, the ski slopes at Vail. It's not something that uh, aesthetically or stylistically really matches um, anything that we've seen in the times up to this date. Uh, but there, you know, as with any transition, there's uh, from from method to method. Um, you'll see some departure um, in in favor of, of from um, typical style uh, in favor of trying out a new uh, method or form. Um, so that's what we're seeing here. In 1992, they probably were making this map using computers as well. And then in 2000, now we're all the way up to when I was paying a little closer attention. This is a source book from a geography class I had at McAllister in 2000, uh, where I, uh, had the presence of mind to print out the New York Times results. Um, and this at the time, it was the New York Times on the web. So it wasn't just nytimes.com yet, it was in the New York Times on the web. And this of course is uh, maybe the only uh, recent analog for what we expected from the 2020 election, which was to have the results and counting to drag on a bit and for there to be an uncertain result um, for some time. So we have headlines like this and maps like this in the paper from that year, a cloudy outcome in the Sunshine State. And I'm gonna skip over all of the awkward early digital maps straight to 2016. And I'm still talking about legacy here. This is my uh, former colleague uh, who's now at the Washington Post and, uh, and friend uh, Sergio Pisanha. Pisanha, he, uh, and I were having lunch a few days before the 2016 election. And of course, I'm showing this photograph because uh, of that taco. Uh, because that taco is very important because it's from El Jevesito, the best taco truck in New York City. Now, in fact, that's not why I'm showing that uh, photo. I'm showing it because this is the sort of atmosphere and these are the sort of sketches that we were making in advance of the 2016 election. As you can see above his head, the whiteboard behind him has a mock-up of a mobile uh, phone with the, uh, the stand-in headline, Clinton wins. And you'll see other, other things on, behind him as well, like maps and some different uh, user interface uh, mock-ups as well. But the, the main thing that catches my eye here is this Clinton wins um, above him. And so we were making these mock-ups in 2016 of what we expected to happen and of what we might want to prepare for. And what didn't happen in reality was not what any of us really expected. Here's another colleague of mine, Larry Buchanan. Behind him, you can see uh, several proofs stacked up. These are maps that we were testing out. This was late in the night on, uh, on election night in 2016. And you know we were working through the night, um, and we weren't 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 quite sure early on what was going what the result was going to be. But pretty quickly, uh, it became apparent that Trump was going to win. And when we saw this on our screens, was one of the first moments we realized that that was going to happen. This is a map each arrow where each arrow represents the shift in margin for each county. And so we had live data coming in from the Associated Press and we were mapping the, the, the vote margin in each county at, to see what the, the regional trends are. So an arrow, a long red arrow here means that it shifted, uh, the, vo the voters there shifted heavily toward Trump and the blue arrows, which as you can see are far fewer, um, are showing where uh, voters shifted uh, more Democrats for, for Clinton. Um, as the, the, uh, as the evening went on, we started looking at this in different ways and, and it was looking like there were just many, many, many red arrows showing a shift for Trump. Um, this is, this was a, a live version made by my colleague, uh, Matthew Block. And this was when we, uh, when we saw this, when it really filled in around 3 a.m. that evening, 
uh, we realized we wanted to, to produce something that would show uh, readers exactly what these arrows meant and what the regional trends were. And so another colleague of mine, Ford Fessenden, had sliced up some, uh, some census data so that we could filter the arrows by things like counties with a population over 150,000, where Obama won in the previous election, where there's uh, white um, people with no bachelor's degree, um, and where Hispanics uh, account for more than 25% of the population of that county. And in, in these maps, we're starting to see what types of populations are um, making up the voter block that is handing Trump the election in 2016. And here's uh, Larry again, mocking up the, the ever important red arrow because that was the story of that election. Everything sh shifting toward Trump. And so we produced this uh, piece overnight, um, a pretty modest piece uh, where I was looking at this this week, realizing that comparing it to our work this year, um, there's really just one takeaway. Um, his most significant support came from counties in, in, in the industrial Midwest where whites without, a college, without college education are the majority. And so he was able to tear down that blue wall, those uh, Midwest states, and, and, win, and win them this time around and, uh, and carry the election because of it. And, you know, he had, he, we ended up having the, running this headline the next day, Trump triumphs. Um, and, you know, I, I can't help but put my friend Sergio next to it with Clinton wins. Um, we, you know, I, I think we all believed that it was a possibility, but we weren't entirely as prepared as, as perhaps we should have been uh, for the, the coverage. And so uh, it, it's kind of in the wake of that shock, um, I spent some time looking at the spatial patterns of these votes and I became rather fascinated with this, you know, the longstanding, uh, quite, quite thoroughly covered um, phenomenon of the urban rural divide. And I was looking at it in, in that web version created by Matthew Block, and then also this uh, print version that Larry and Hayan Park and I uh, made, where you can see these rings of red bubbles. This is the vote margin. So the larger the bubble, well, the more voters there were for that party. Red is a Republican, so Trump, and blue is Democrat, so that would be Clinton. And so you see these uh, you know, population centers, the bigger blue circles are surrounded by you know, just numerous, numerous uh, suburban and, and rural uh, red bubbles. And so I plotted the, um, the distribution, this did a scatter plot of the population of all of these counties against the shift. And what, what I found was that overwhelmingly um, sparsely populated or, or counties with uh, low population shifted very, very Republican. And I came up with this idea of uh, interpolating a zero vote margin, margin line. So I took all of the margins uh, where, you know, areas where um, Clinton won by a lot, like LA or Chicago, um, and, uh, and, you know, areas where Trump won a lot, uh, won by a lot, like Maricopa County and parts of the heartland and Midwest. And I created this interpolated line that separated them. And I also created a 3D surface to see what it would look like to, um, you know, show that raw margin. Um, as a surface and that, so that's a, an oblique view and this is a, 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 um, a side view, profile view. And you see these giant blue spikes, Clinton lost this election as you know, famously as we know. Um, but what, what happened here is this is, uh, what we have is it's, a, it's sort of the difference between a, a 10 foot wide uh, wall and a 10 foot uh, tall wall. These areas that's, that fill up the US all voted for Trump. And so it more than made up for these big blue spikes we see on the map, uh, at least in the electoral college. And so I kept going and I, you know, I made the map asymmetric. I stripped out unpopulated areas and I wanted to see what that looked like. Um, then I mapped it against a previous election. This is uh, the Bush v. Gore election in 2000, the one from my source book. And 
you know, you can see some similar that the black lines on this map are from 2016 and the colors in the background are, um, are the Bush v. Gore um, map. You can see that there are similar patterns, but they're not the same. So I thought, hey, why don't I look at the last several elections? So I did that as well. And there, there do seem to be kind of these two Americas that emerge from each, uh, each election, but none quite like 2016. And because of the dissonance between the coverage leading up to the 2016 election and the result, um, we made this map, I made this map called Trump's America, where I just cut out using that zero vote margin line, all of the areas uh, that were won by Clinton. And then I did the, the reverse as well. Here's my, my mom holding that map up against a, um, a wall map. But I did this also, I did it for Trump and I did it for Clinton. So you get these islands for Clinton and you get this kind of like Swiss cheese cutout uh, continent for Trump. And this was something at the time that felt like a natural response to that dissonance that I mentioned. There's Clinton's America one more time. And so we had to do some rethinking. We were in a, we were in a new kind of media landscape, obviously new political landscape. What, uh, how are we gonna, how are we gonna cover this going forward? And, and, um, and you know, how are we going to be more careful and how are we going to be more prepared? And um, you know, journalists are always trying to be better. This is not a new phenomenon, but this was, this was, a, um, this was a, an event, the 2016 election that had us all wanting to be just even more better than normal, even more better. Um, so we did some rethinking. Um, this is an illustration that my wife did of uh, Trump as a planet with a star behind him, which will make sense in a moment. Um, and, and part of why we had to do some rethinking was that we had events like this, uh, where you know uh, Trump had his inauguration. We did a, an analysis piece, count you know, with some scientists who counted the crowds, compared it to Obama's inauguration, and we were able to find you know where these highest dense, density areas were, where you know, Trump's crowd was and Clinton's crowd was, and then we you know that evening have this press conference uh, from Sean Spicer where he's saying that the, this is the largest audience ever to witness an inauguration period, both in person and around the globe. And you know, a few weeks after that, we have you know, the president himself tweeting that the fake news media, you know, including the New York Times, NBC News, ABC, CBS, CNN, is not his enemy, but the enemy of the American people. Um, and so we have to be extra, extra careful what we're doing. And so I'm giving an example here of a piece that didn't make it through. This is, a, this is a graphic that I created in 2017. And the idea was to do something a little cheeky, a little fun about the various things that uh, Donald Trump had said about uh, places around the US. Um, and we were call calling it uh, you know, Planet Trump. And so we have Texas is an incredible place, but in Mexico, there are bad dudes. But he also at one point said, we like Mexico. And uh, Arizona is a great state that he won by a lot. Um, you know, it, talking in North Carolina, he said the first man to sail the skies in a very little airplane came from there. Um, and he calls Mar-a-Lago one of the great places on this continent. Um, he calls the world a total mess and space is terrific. Um, these are all quotes uh, from Trump that we thought we could compose uh, and composite into a, uh, a sort of globe uh, that would give you a sense of what he thinks of all these places. Um, but in the end, because of the atmosphere we were in and the coverage and, uh, and everything, I spiked the story. Um, this is a photo of an editor's spike. Um, so we say uh, that we spike stories um, when, when we just aren't going to do them for one reason or another. And this, this was spiked. I spiked this because I felt that it was unfair. Um, you could take uh, Bernie Sanders, you could take Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, and you could, you know, you could uh, scrape through all the archives of all of their stump speeches ever and have them say, you know, compose them all into a, um, a, a map that makes makes it look like they have no idea what's going on. 
Um, and so without comparing Trump to any other politicians, uh, namely Clinton in this case, um, it just felt like an unfair uh, piece. And so this is an example of how we were trying to be a bit uh, better in that time after the election. In this time after the election as well, it was time for me to take a personal break from, uh, from journalism. As uh, Libby mentioned in the intro, I did uh, leave the Times uh, for a couple of years. I moved to New Mexico. This is uh, Glorieta Mesa, uh, south of Santa Fe. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, this is an image that I, I made some months ago of that Mesa. Uh, Santa Fe is a, a beautiful place. Uh, this is a view in my neighborhood. It's a, it's a rainbow factory in the, in the summer. Um, and this is uh, White Sands in, in Southern New Mexico. It's just a very, very beautiful place to be and to live and, and to take a break from politics. But in the end, I still lived in the Santa Fe Sea um, from my Two Americas map. And, and because of that, and because of my job at the time working with media, I kind of couldn't escape journalism and storytelling. Um, and so I did projects with the Financial Times, National Geographic, um, the New York Times, ProPublica, Chicago Tribune, LA Times, and Washington Post, along with my colleague Krishna Kara, and we we just kind of kept kept working on stories until finally I had this memory of some um, some sketching that I did in 2016 on the physical landscapes of these places that voted in different ways in 2016. Here's Hancock, Georgia, and Glasscock, Georgia, two counties in Georgia one that voted overwhelmingly for Clinton and one that voted overwhelmingly for Trump. From the sky, they look very similar. And I, that to me uh, was very interesting, very curious, something that I wanted to investigate and I didn't get a chance to do it at the times. Um, in, uh, and here's another example, Ogallala, Lakota, uh, South Dakota and Sheridan, Nebraska, again, overwhelmingly for Clinton in the North and overwhelmingly for Trump in the South. And, so working with this new colleague of mine, Krishna Kara, um, I decided the break from politics was over. This was um, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, um, or a little bit less than a year ago. Um, I thought that it would be worth taking a look at this really fine tuned geographic unit that we have precincts and slicing up all of the aerial imagery of the US from 2016 to see if we could find any trends. And, the idea here is kind of an extension of the Two Americas map. We've looked at the urban-rural divide. We've looked at that over and over again. It's been written about kind of ad nauseum. Um, I've contributed to that nausea. Um, but I wanted to take one step further and, look, and, and say something about what these places look like. So this is a, a, a satellite image, a composite image of the, the United States. And here I've taken, I, I wrote a little bit of code to take all of the, Im the colors in that image and sort them by lightness and uh, size the dots by frequency. I was just doing some, some, a little bit of sketching to see what things could be done to, to figure out what places look like. And so here's, uh, you know, living in New Mexico and being obsessed with the landscape here and in awe of it constantly. I thought I would take a look at New Mexico as well. And so here's the New Mexico landscape, lots of browns and dark colors. And some, you know, obviously you could see white sands there, it's quite big. And then I thought I'd take, you know, what's the opposite of New Mexico? Well, maybe, uh, maybe Vermont is the opposite of New Mexico. Let's take a look at all of the different green hues here and their frequency. And then I thought I would take a look at a more high resolution image. So this is Chicago. And these are the colors in the Chicago image. And because it's cropped out into Lake Michigan, you can see lots of blue in that distribution. And while I was working on this, I thought, well, why don't I just resort the image? Why don't I just take this image uh, of Chicago and resort all of the pixels from light to dark? I wonder what that would look like. And so this, with a little bit of scripting, is what that looked like. And all of, the, all of this sketching and musing resulted in a piece that uh, published, because of the, the pandemic, published several months after completion in September. Um, 
we called it the true colors of America's political spectrum, or gray and green. And the idea is that we took those uh, precincts level uh, results and mapped them across the uh, political spectrum uh, to see what colors correspond to the way that people vote across the political spectrum. Um, in the story, uh, you know, it's, it's, we sort of hold your hand through an example. This is Blue Ridge, Virginia. Um, and this is Blue Ridge, Virginia's colors sorted. Here are two more examples. This is farmland in the Finger Lakes of New York. And this is uh, the Mojave Desert in California. We have Boise, Idaho and Newport Beach, California. They're all very different colors. And of course, these places are all different. They all, they're not just the colors, that everything is different about them, the culture, how people vote and everything. And then we started to uh, look at very specifically uh, the, you know, the, these vote margins. So here's South Carolina, here's Washington, 30% uh, plus for Clinton, a place in Washington state. Here's a place in Michigan where the vote was split between uh, Trump and Clinton in 2016. Here's a place in Arizona and so on. So we were looking at these images. All of these images are uh, one meter resolution um, and they're available for the 48 uh, contiguous United States uh, plus DC. Um, and so we thought, because we had access to this cloud platform, why don't we process uh, every square meter of the United States and see if we can find some trends? And in fact, we could. Um, on the left here, you see areas won by Clinton uh, plus 100%. And on the right, we see areas won by Trump plus 100%, and in the middle, even. And on, so all the way to the left, what you're seeing is a lot of gray. Uh, that's most likely pavement and a developed uh, land, uh, rooftops and the like. Uh, and on the right, we see more green, we see forests, we see agriculture. And on the extreme right, we see um, barren lands, fallow lands, and uh, you know, farm, farmland between uh, crops. Um, and so you have a real trend across, this is, across the entire US where you can see what types of uh, colors are in the landscapes across the political spectrum. And, uh, you know, we thought, you know, maybe this is uh, bogus, maybe we should check this. This seems, this seems wild that this trend would be so pronounced. So we, you know, we, we look, looked around and we found a data set. Uh, the National Land Cover data set is at a different resolution, but it is covers the same ge uh, geography, and we were able to create the same chart using land cover classification. So here we're able to actually label that this developed land in cities and towns, forests, farms, water, and other. And the trend is the same. We see exactly what's happening in the aerial imagery and why those colors might have those trends. And then of course we thought, well, why don't we just do it in each state to see if there's a trend in each state? And by and large, there is a trend in each state, particularly the states with large uh, population centers uh, like Massachusetts and New York. Um, but even in areas like Oregon, um, you can see uh, that there is a trend to uh, more um, agriculture and more um, barren lands on the, on the Republican end. Um, and there are, you know, there's a lot to be uh, explored here, but um, we were pretty excited that, um, that the trend held both across the whole US and within many of the states. We took a closer look at a couple of different states. Here's the Texas landscape. So we have, uh, you know, it's calling out specific uh, little thumbnail images of Lubbock, Texas and Chase, Chase Oaks and uh, Jacksonville, Texas. And then of course we, you know, we point out that this is not, we're not trying to prove that the colors of these landscapes will indicate how you vote. This is not uh, an environmental determinism thing. This is an observational uh, geography um, piece where we're just trying to show what kind of observations we can make with the massive amounts of compute that we have, the computing power. So well, there are exceptions, of course. We have suburban lookalikes where the vote is very different. In this area, we have Washington, D.C. and Cranston, Rhode Island and Patton, Illinois, all voted very differently, but on first glance, they look quite similar. 
And then we'll also have rural lookalikes that voted very differently. Which brings us to 2020, which is of course what this talk uh, was supposed to be about, but I've given you all the context now. Uh, this year has been difficult for uh, basically everyone. Um, and there, the newsroom is no exception. I rejoined the newsroom in July um, in sort of the early planning for the election because there was so much else going on in the world that was a priority for coverage. Here are two uh, front pages from um, March. Uh, one is showing job losses and one is showing a coronavirus toll. Both of them are breaking the form of the front page because the news is so, so important. In the chart on the left, we see that they've, uh, that, you know, we have everything on the same scale and the, the job losses um, have just completely gone off the scale. So they use an entire column that would have otherwise been dedicated to text for that single bar. And in the map on the right, we see that the spike in New York goes over the K in the, the top New York Times logo. And in September, we had historic wildfires in the West. Here's a couple, here's one day in September where the smoke was stretching all the way out over the Pacific Ocean. And over the course of just a few weeks in September, these wildfires at the scale of them was, was just terrifying. Um, Resources for fighting were stretched bare, you know, completely bare. And uh, it was unclear when they would stop. In fact, the September alone uh, accounted for more, uh, had more wildfire detections using this firm system that NASA has uh, than any other uh, entire year since 2000. So all of 2018, which was also a horrific year when the campfire tore through um, parts of California, um, the entire year did not have as many fire detections as just September of, of this year. And of course, we also had historic wildfire or um, hurricanes. And you know, this is this is all coverage that while there is some overlap with politics, uh, was was not uh, particularly election mappy. Um, this, this is a map uh, showing hurricane, at the end of hurricane, this is just a sketch, at the end of the hurricane season showing some of the, the or all of the paths that crossed over the southeast of the U.S. And you can see uh, parts of Terrebonne Parish in Louisiana experienced hurricane or tropical uh, storm force winds five times. Um, in July, my boss asked me to take a look at what the hurricane and wildfire seasons were going to be like. And at the time, according to NOAA, the hurricane season was, was likely to be busy. And of course, now we know it was uh, the busiest ever. Um, and the fire season was likely to be above normal. And of course, you know, so given the figures that I just shared, it was far, far above normal. This, this is a chart from September comparing the 2020 fire season in Washington State, Oregon, and California to recent years. And it's just, again, off the charts. And the hurricane season uh, had 30 named storms, and 13 of them uh, were named or were hurricanes. Not to mention the pandemic is on the rise in the days leading up to the election. And so we're all at home, and how do we how do we do this? <clears throat> Excuse me. We are uh, one one way that we're covering this is we we have to take a look at um, the way people are voting now. So here, uh, you know, a week before the election, more than half of uh, voters from 2016 have already showed up. We have special projects to track uh, turnout in early voting. And uh, my colleague Alicia Parlopiano uh, does a piece on how long uh, voting will take because we're looking at a situation where it might take some, some time to know the results of the election. This harkens back to uh, the early days of the New York Times, like the beginning of my talk, where you have headlines like this after a Lincoln was uh, elected, Abraham Lincoln probably elected president. 
Uh, so there's some probably situations that we might be facing and we need to figure out how to cover those. Um, so how do we plan for that? We had countless docs, I'm not gonna share all of them. I'll probably just share one here where we were sharing inspiration and, do, and doing planning for what kind of coverage we might do. This is a document that uh, I created with my colleague, Matthew Block, where we were sharing inspiration for cartograms that we might publish when we're ready to uh, publish maps. You'll see some, some of the inspiration there as uh, looks familiar. It's uh, you know, some of the early um, New York Times cartograms. And we also had a schedule that was just very precise to make sure that everyone was fresh and we were all covering everything appropriately. Here is a video that scrolls through what everyone will be doing in the week following the election. And there we have live results and we have polling and we have print results and print enterprise. And of course, uh, the backdrop of all of this is the pandemic. And so we still have people working uh, regularly through the election, not on the election, but on the pandemic. And we meet virtually, just like this talk. We have meeting after meeting where we can't go to the printer and look at what our stuff looks like before we print it. So we're, we're holding things up to the camera and trying to get a sense of what the colors might look like in the piece that we're doing. And you know, here's a Here's a, a piece that um, some of my colleagues were working on. You know, does this blue and this red work? Do, will this work? Can you tell through this screen? Um, we had many, 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 many meetings um, leading up to the election um, to make sure that we were going to cover it uh, properly and, and be ready, um, both for web and for the print, print product. This is the first print piece that I helped publish after the election. Uh, this is similar to the map that I showed you that was an inspiration for Two Americas in 2016. It shows bubbles uh, as a, a way of showing the margin of victory in each county. So you, should, you can see in blue the, the counties that were won by Biden. Um, and the you know, big blue bubbles are places like Los Angeles and uh, Cook County where Chicago is and Illinois um, and, and, and New York. Um, and then you have all of the red bubbles that kind of like, you know, uh, are, are Trump voters in all of the, across the rest of the United States. Um, this is a map that uh, was authored by several people. This, uh, you know, it wasn't even just the four people um, in, in this byline. Um, and we wanted to take, you know, we wanted to take a different approach than we did in 2016. This is showing, um, again, the, the vote margin, but we can see is that there's no overlap in those bubbles. So this is different from 2016. Um, this is uh, something that a colleague, Charlie Smart developed, which is a, a Dorling cartogram that um, is directed in a way that prevents overlap of bubbles. So you can see in 2016, you can still see those other bubbles underneath the large Chicago bubble that represents a larger population. But uh, you know they don't get their own space, and so this year we decided that we would give them their own space, even if they were a bit pushed off to the side um, of of the larger population. Uh, they did get you know they get their own um, day in the sun, uh, and so that was Chicago. Here's Atlanta, which is a big story this year. Uh, here's Philadelphia, Baltimore, and uh, northern D.C. suburbs, New York City. Uh, because the population is so high, was kind of shoved out into the ocean. So we have Bronx, Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn, Staten Island. And then you know, uh, San Antonio and Austin, Texas. And then we did something else different, which uh, you know, for cartographers might be slightly contentious. We put elevation, we put a little slight uh, uh, elevation map behind um, this bubble map to give a hint at where uh, you know where the obstacles to population are, so it filled out the the west a bit more and gave it a you know, more visual balance. Here's a gaff that I made when we were starting to talk about um, showing showing the vote shift. You remember the arrow maps from 2016? I used Charlie Smart's uh, script to vote to to do 
bubbles of, uh, of vote margin shift and uh, my scaling was all wrong. So it created a, a bubbly mess, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, and, you know, in the days after the election, we were looking at these, you know, trying to recreate that analysis piece that we did in 2016. What's the story with these areas that shifted, you know, South, Southern Texas uh, shifted a very uh, uh, toward Trump um, you know, parts of, uh, parts of Utah shifted, shifted toward Trump. We have, you know, the Atlanta suburb, suburbs are shifting toward Biden. What, you know, how can we tell these stories? But as you can see on this map, even at just, you know, a few days after the election, it isn't completely filled in because the, the votes hadn't been counted enough to the point where we were comfortable with the way that we were showing them. Like you can't show, or you shouldn't perhaps show, uh, a margin, a percent margin, when you only have uh, half of your votes counted or some such. And, you know, as we know this week, uh, this is taking quite a while to get a certified vote. So we have a situation where, you know, like Abraham Lincoln was probably elected, we had arrows that were probably right, but we decided to not have probably arrows. And instead, the piece uh, was held and uh, we're working on it this week and it will publish this Saturday. So go get a paper and find those, uh, those definitely arrows. They won't be probably arrows on, on Saturday. This is another thing I noticed that I think is kind of fun and subtle that happens with print designers as they are working in the days after an election. This is the front pages from Thursday, Saturday and Sunday after the election. And you can see that the uh, electoral map of states is it, it remains on the page as the headlines um, change, uh, but the size changes and uh, the, you know, the as the headlines are, are changing. I thought that was kind of interesting. What, the, what, what is interesting to, to note here too is that um, I don't have it marked here, but you can, if you imagine the top half of these images is above the fold and the bottom half is below. Um, if the paper is folded like it is naturally, those first two maps are not visible when you pick up the paper, but the last one is in the, uh, in the front page that declares Biden the uh, victor. In the meantime, we have an analysis team. I wasn't on this team, but it, they, they were doing the same job that uh, we did in 2016, uh, where we produced uh, an arrow analysis where we showed where the vote shifted, Democrat or Republican. Um, they were very organized. They had all the data ready ahead of time, and they were able to create these shift arrow uh, maps of several states. So those are the Midwestern states. We also have uh, Florida and Texas. Uh, and all told, they did eight pieces that were published over five days. Um, they did Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Michigan, uh, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Wisconsin. Um, and th so this is quite an organized effort compared to what we did in 2016. In 2016, we, we did, you know, not to sell ourselves short, we did quite a lot of analysis, but the only similar piece was this one, which was created in a day, <coughs> which had, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, about one takeaway, which is that the most significant support for Trump came from counties in the indu industrial Midwest where whites without college education or the majority. And so we were perhaps uh, learning from the past this year and we were able to cover the election a little bit more thoroughly. Uh, and another example of that is something that the upshot did with precinct level results showing how the vote shifted uh, in Georgia. And you can just see this very stunning trend in the Atlanta suburbs where almost universally, um, they shifted um, overwhelmingly toward uh, Biden, um, giving Biden the win in Georgia. And, you know, so for the last several weeks, we've, we've watched in the news and we've been covering um, all of the uh, lawsuits about uh, challenging votes and and, uh, you know, headline after headline about that. And then, you know, on December 2nd, we see this uh, headline about uh, William Barr, uh, where he's saying that there's no basis for fraud in any of these claims. And we just keep covering the election. And so just this week, we finally have uh, secured, uh, or we have a, a certified vote where Biden secures enough electors to be a president. 
Um, but we will keep we will keep going. We'll keep mapping um, for uh, you know all the way through the next uh, pre um, through Biden's presidency and and on and on. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, we really appreciate it. And it's exciting to know that Saturday we'll be able to see the product of all the 2020 arrows. Um, it's so interesting. This talk was originally scheduled for November 18th. And it's amazing to me how much more you can share now than you would have been able to share then. Um, yeah, and more next week and more the week after that. It just keeps going. Yeah. So we would love to open up the Q&A. Um, if you want to go ahead and type any questions you might have into that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, we'll be able to see those pop up. And Matthew is going to moderate those as they come in. Um, I'll just kick off with one question, Tim, while, while folks are writing in their questions. And certainly it's Matthew's prerogative to do the same, but those questions are popping in. Um, how much control does the quote unquote map room in 2020 have over how an election gets mapped and what gets published? Sort of who is, is asking for certain things or feeding certain things, or do you all have a lot of creative control? I'm just interested. Um, so so you refer, the map room you're referring to is sort of like the anyone who's making maps and what the coordination is like. You and sure. your colleagues, yeah. How much yeah. control do you have over what ends up in the paper or what ends up online? Um, so there, this, this year was a bit different. There were, um, I, I think in the, in the past, um, we, you know, everyone, everyone is, is a pro. We're all quite good at, uh, mapping and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, we can feel confident in our work because we do it every day. Um, but th this year, you know, as I mentioned with that last, uh, you know, one of the last slides on the analysis, pe analysis pieces, those were published over the course of five days. You know, in past elections, something that took that long to get out might be considered late. Um, but, you know, th this year especially, this is always true, but this year especially, getting it right was way more important than getting it first. Um, so there, there, the decisions were, you know, <laughs> the communication was a bit different this year because it was all over Slack and on, you know, Google chat and email and phone calls, um, but everything has several eyes on it before it gets out the door. Um, and in terms of the, you know, the maps that show results, they get lots and lots of traffic. Um, those maps were in development for months and months, if not years by a handful of folks who had regular check-ins from editors, you know, all the way up the chain. So, um, there's, there is a lot of internal scrutiny before it finally gets published. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Matthew to moderate Tim and just thank you once again for a terrific talk. Of course, thank you for having me. Thanks Libby. And thank you, Tim, for a very interesting talk. Um, the questions are starting to come in, so I won't bother with mine, which sort of parallel Libby's. Um, a couple of questions um, which basically boil down to the um, question you probably anticipate, which is what kind of software and hardware systems have you been using? Um, and I would just throw in and how have they changed? I mean, you've been with the New York Times a long time yeah. now. Yeah. Um, so there'll be some some kind of interesting shifts there. Sure. Uh, so it's 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 a large team in the graphics department and in, on Upshot at the Times, um, and so there are lots of uh, preferred tools that folks have, um, and we're not like a one a one tool shop where or a handful of tools that are whitelisted that we can use. <clears throat> um, you, you're sort of encouraged to use what uh, what you're you know good at using um, within reason. Um, but having said that, uh, it's it's a lot of um, a lot of coding, a lot of JavaScript and HTML and um, and uh, D three the uh, you know the the mapping and, and graphing library is is used. The map that um, Charlie Smart uh, worked on with with me to make those um, Dorling bubbles uh, for print um, 
is the first example I can think of where the pipeline of tools went from his uh, node code that used D3 to render uh, SVG that I was then taking into Adobe Illustrator uh, and then using some mapping plugins to get it ready for print. It was, um, you know, the tools are kind of all over the place. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's fun. So, so <clears throat> a mixture then really of statistical packages to crunch the data that you're then sucking into design software. Yeah. So you're not really using GIS and geographic information systems. And I, stuff. you know, I suspect that some people published maps using QGIS. Um, I did not. Um, I have in the past, obviously, um, and I've used ArcGIS. I used that in 2016. We didn't use that this year, um, but yes, there is a, there is a bit of GIS, but it, there's um, I, I, as D3 gains more prominence the the pipeline is becoming more like you you know do your statistics your statistics and your analysis in the terminal um render your graphics using uh web libraries like d3 and then if you need to do something in print you use some custom code to get it out of off the web and, and into a print friendly format for print the times is very much what mobile and web web first um and, and not just first, but far before print in most cases. Well, that actually raises a question from Tom Sander, um, who says, I'm a New York Times digital subscriber. Do all the maps in the print edition also appear at the New York Times digital site? They, there was a time when they did almost, um, they almost did, but now it's, um, there's far more maps on the web and there are sometimes print only maps. Um, a good example from my talk of a print only map was that um, the bubble Dorling cartogram margin map from, 20, uh, from 2020 from this year, the, the one made in D3 and then you know um, made into a print graphic by me and others. Um, that there are types of maps that don't they don't really work quite as well on the web. And that was one of them where the resolution that you're getting from a full page of, you know, 900 DPI um, ink is something that you just don't like no one, no one experiences uh, or no one uses their screen quite like that, at least now, um, you know, they have televisions that might have that kind of resolution. But you don't, you know, normally see people kind of like going up to the TV and, you know, zooming over it with their head. So there are, there are definitely like fixed resolution, fixed scale types of graphics and maps that are, are print only. And they're, they're delightful to make too. Cool. Um, I'm going to leap ahead because <clears throat> it follows on from this. Um, and no last name. Uh, so can you talk about some of your online interactive maps, which are clearly not printed? Um, FYI, I appreciate being able to scroll and get county data. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm not a front end developer personally, but I've definitely worked on interactive uh, projects on teams that build them. Um, before I left the Times uh, in 2018. Um, I worked on a you know a handful of pieces that were uh, starting to do a uh, something that we're seeing more often now, where the map is interactive, but it isn't um, a free form interaction where you like a Google Map where you can just zoom wherever you want and look at whatever you want. The map is um, is more of something that the that the story takes you through. So an example of that would be a story that we did about uh, Houston after uh, Hurricane Harvey showing, you know, at both at the regional scale, how much um, rain fell, and then, you know, zooming into the map all the way down to like what houses were flooded 
and you know what the history of planning uh, city planning was in that region. And it's a very curated map experience. That is something that is uh, very hard to pull off in print, if at all. Um, and so those those are the types of maps that are very fun to work on um, on the web. Cool. Um, one comment from Donald at Geographicus Maps um, is really a comment, it's not a question, and it's a very polite comment, <laughs> unlike many. Uh, <laughs> sorry, academic in-joke there. Um, Owen Royce would be thrilled by absolutely all that the New York Times has done. Um, I would agree, would you? Who would be? Owen Royce. Oh, all right. I, uh, I, all right. I, oh. I Race. God, I, yeah, I, I would be thrilled if if there were a way to know that. Um, uh, yeah, that's quite a quite a quite a comment. <laughs> um, we definitely take inspiration from that body of work, um, and I you know I can't look away from um, is it, what is it general cartography the, yeah. the, the is that yeah. such a such a great text. Um, Nineteen thirty eight. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, and some of those, I scrolled through them very quickly, but some of those cartograms, um, both Royce cartograms and then also A.S. Haro cartograms are uh, continue to be an inspiration for a type of map that I would like to produce that show, you know, both states um, and metros at, at, you know, at scale. So when you have a metro region like Chicago um, or New York City that, you know, extends beyond a state, you could see kind of like nested metro areas, and and uh, and I believe Royce did that, and and also As Haro, um, yeah, great body of work there. Cool. Um, Gordon Means asks a key, very key question: How do you validate your data to protect against dead votes or other double counting? Uh, so I. That is was not a part of my work this time around, but I can tell you that um, there there was a special team this year uh, um, that was dedicated to building um, building a little pipeline that would read all of our data feeds uh, and and flag anything that looked suspicious. Um, I haven't followed up with them to see how that has you know how that went, but. These are the types of things that we were talking about and preparing for this year, and um, and you know we were we were very deliberate in in the way that we uh, called states and when you know when we decided to map um, you know certain things like this map that um, will be in uh, the paper this Saturday. We could have we could have done it the week the weekend after the election. Um, but the, it would have been a very different map and it would have told a story that was true only in a way that would be very difficult to explain. You know, if each arrow shows uh, a vote margin that uh, is only representative of some small fraction of the people who, are, who, are, who had voted in that county, um, other outlets published similar maps immediately uh, and we we took a different uh, approach and waited um, so that you know that I think is probably the easiest answer there is that we were deliberate we looked at everything very carefully and we waited until we were absolutely certain uh, this is unlike any other um, election I can I can think of waiting this long you know over a month uh, to finally publish a, a map that basically is just results right um, so that that's that's that should answer part of the question at least. Cool. Thank you. Um, oh, good. Some more popping in. Uh, Anne Knowles from the University of Maine, another UW grad. Yay, go Badgers. Um, asks the map work by New York Times has been so inspiring during your tenure. Thanks a million. Yay. What advice would you give aspiring cartographers and data visualizers for educational and technical training? Is your kind of diverse background helpful or essential? Wow, I, I don't think I, that. Well, thank you. That's so kind of you. Um, I don't know that my my background was. Right, my father for years called me a gradual student, 
uh, <laughs> I was in grad school forever. Um, so I, I don't know that that's, that's necessary. I do think, you know, it doesn't hurt to have a rounded off background, especially in journalism, um, being kind of a, a generalist um, who, who has a couple of um, uh, specialties is, is very helpful. Um, the graphics desk at the Times um, is populated by people of, you know, with all kinds of backgrounds. We have statisticians, historians, we have PhDs in literature, we have, you know, geographers, handful of geographers, and we have, you know, classic journalists, we have, um, you know, front end developers and, and engineers. Um, and everyone kind of, you know, comes to it with their own expertise, which is very helpful when you're working in a, in a group like, like that. Um, the, oh, I forgot the other part of the question. Um, Hmm. Well, oh. training. Uh, yeah. is, there anything, is, is there anything specific? Yes, right. That, so that somebody should have if they're going to. Yeah. Come so, so, so it's very. I, I would say that the you know I mentioned in the in earlier that uh, people use uh, whatever tool they're comfortable with. I think it's you know if if you're an undergrad or a grad student who's kind of tinkering in um, in in graphics, it's helpful to become acquainted with all of the tools that you know are out there, at least the free ones. You know, try to develop a, a map using D3. Try using, you know, R or R Studio to do a little bit of statistical analysis. And, you know, thanks to the web, we can all do that with a little tutorial by searching on Google. Um, and then this is something I always say to students, um, just be generous with what you share, and and it, if if you're friendly, generally the the community will be friendly right back to you, and you and you can grow and and become the you know whatever sort of journalist or visualizer you want to. Cool. Thank you. Um, two more questions knocking in. I I do have to say that we have a hard stop at seven thirty, uh, which is when I think the. Uh, that yeah, guy <laughs> goes off the clock and yeah. everything shuts down. Um, but a couple of questions about the future uh, uh, lurking in the Q&A feed. Um, Andrew Jeb asks a uh, really good question. You've given us a sense for how tech is able to reimagine what mapping and visual data means. Can you speak to what it might be in a decade? Um. So during my little hiatus there from the Times, I worked at this um, this satellite analysis firm here in Santa Fe called uh, Descartes Labs, and part of what excited me about them was was their ability to uh, combine you know massive amounts of data that were previously kind of inaccessible because they were so big with all of this new uh, technology and, and new methods for processing like machine learning and even just doing something like a statistical regression over decades of, of a satellite imagery or earth imagery or um, aerials drone imagery um, that that has only just begun um, and so that you know that the colors piece that I shared where we processed the physical color of every square meter of the lower 48. That's kind of just like the tip of the iceberg, I think. Um, we, you know, we're st we still have lots of messy data problems, um, like, you know, getting election results into precinct polygons that change constantly and things like that. Um, but once the data is in shape, our ability to process and find trends, find and reveal trends that um, that we, you know we either don't know are there, we have a hunch they're there, but we've never been able to really look. I think that's that's the future. Cool. Um, the last question that I've got on my list. So if anybody has any questions, feel feel free to use the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, Christy Chapman Mitchell. Hey, Christy. Um, have you started planning the cartographic coverage for 2024? 
uh, I, not formally, but there are definitely ideas floating around already. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't ever stop. Um, I mean, it's like, it's yeah. And 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 you know, I I share all of these these images from the 1800s and throughout the 1900s and uh, all the way through like work that I've done in over the last decade. Um, because in a way, at least with my work, I, I, I have like, they're all kind of mental footnotes for something I want to eventually do. And you, ca you can't help, but when you're working on an election, think about what you'll do next time, you know, differently um usually uh because of something that you're you know very excited about um something that i'm particularly excited about at the times is that um the graphics desk is is getting bigger and it's getting to the point where we're able to work more with people who are kind of uh spread out across the country and the world so when we you know when we do these statistical maps that typically would have data and anecdotes on it that we've pulled from a spreadsheet from the census or from some government agency, um, we're gonna get much richer coverage now because we have people who live in these places. Um, and so 2024, that, that's something I'm, I'm very much looking forward to is a, a richer coverage uh, where you know, the pieces are being, um, if not written, then edited or, or um, um, or looked over by people who are from the places that are being mapped. Cool. Um, one last uh, thank you on the Q&A for a great talk. I'm gonna ask you just for very briefly while we've got a few minutes. Um, in my own teaching, when I, when, I, when I talk about visualization of data and there's this classic issue that when we look at the United States, especially the contiguous 48, where every state is geographically correct, but then we have big states with low populations, small states with very high populations. Um, and then I, I lead students through, uh, and I'm blanking on the uh, professor's name at Michigan who does the um, online cartograms, um, mm. where he shows both um, cartograms of population and then bivariate distribution. So uh, you have a lot of purple, so, so between the red and the blue. Um, but with the exception of the, of a few cartograms that you showed in the legacy part, part of your talk, um, nothing that you were showing from 2016, 2020, uh, cartograms, you were using the geographical outline. Right, right. Um, was there any, anything conscious about keeping the geographical outline mm -hmm. um, and not going on the cartogram. Yeah, so this is a, yeah, this could be its own talk, right? Um, <laughs> the, the, I, I can hear, I can hear Cardo Twitter just chanting right now, land doesn't vote. Um, yes, exactly. But, uh, it, it, it's, you know, there's every map obviously is several, you know, series of compromises. Um, We've, you know, we've found over, you know, decades of experience that um, cartograms are generally difficult to understand unless you are very, very familiar with the geography. And to expect readers to be intimately familiar with the geography and like topology of all of the regions of the U.S. Um, is, is tough. And, you know, so you end up making making maps with, or cartograms with, you know, heavy annotation. Um, and many people are doing this quite well now. I thought, uh, I think it was Bloomberg published one this, this year that added the Mississippi River and a couple of water features to the cartogram, which I thought really helped. Um, this year, our compromise was that Dorling cartogram mm -hmm. bubble map, uh, which is, I, I thought we would get more pushback on that. Um, because we're mixing forms, right? It is a geographic map. It's an Albers USA projected equal area base map with somewhat gratuitous those. <laughs> with, with, with cartogram bubbles on top. And, and you know, when we decided to do that, I, my first uh, kind of point that, or, or like stake in the ground that I drove was 
we need to put an absolute like ton of labels on this thing because once you start like throwing diagram on top of a map, people can lose their orientation really quickly. Um, and thankfully, because it was a high resolution, full page print map, we were able to throw hundreds of labels on it. Um, and I think it, you know, I think it worked pretty well because of that. It kind of falls apart on the East Coast because it's so crowded. Um, but in the end, you know, that you're, you end up kind of telling a side story about how densely populated that region is, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but yeah, you know, like I, I, I showed that the brainstorming doc um, where we were looking at all the different cartogram forms over time. And, um, you know, we published a lot of cartograms this year. We just didn't, I don't believe we did one with election results. Maybe there'll be one next week. Who knows? Next week. Yeah. That's a great point to stop. We, as we are reaching the wishing hour, at least by the clock on my computer, which who knows if that's anything like the clock on anybody else's computer, who knows. Um, so thank you, Tim. This was a great talk. Thank you for, for sharing your knowledge, your expertise. Um, and I really do hope to see you in Maine in the near future. In a few weeks, let's say. Yay, that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you, so much, Matthew. thank you, Libby, and uh, you know, thank you everyone for joining. I really appreciate it.